Hello everyone, welcome to The Voice of Nursing. My name is Adrian Tracy, CEO of ICG Medical. Uh, today we're joined by Michael Mulwini. Michael, welcome to The Voice of Nursing. Thank you, it's good to be here. Tell us about your journey through nursing. How did you get started? Yeah, well, do you know, I actually kind of fell into nursing. So I went to a, a grammar school back in Northern Ireland and your career options were always medicine, law or business. Um, and I did some work experience uh, with some doctors in Northern Ireland and I very quickly thought this isn't for me. Um, but in order to get the UCAS points, I had taken a part-time job in a local nursing home um, to make the CV look better for the med school applications. But I absolutely fell in love working in the nursing home. Um, and I was to this day still say that being a healthcare assistant in the nursing home was the best job I ever had. Um, and I was very fortunate in that it was a very good nursing home, it was well run, um, the staff were brilliant um, and that was where I really learned the basics about what it meant to care for somebody. Um, to not just do a bed bath but properly care for someone. Um, and to this day I still draw on the skills I learned those when I started there at 16. Um, so finished my A-levels and knew by this point that I did not want to be a doctor. Um, but I really loved the nursing home so I, I put an application in for nursing school. Um, and to my happy surprise, I absolutely fell in love with the job. Um, qualified back in 2009, Queens in Belfast, and then moved over to England and took my first job as a staff nurse in Queens Hospital in Romford. And that started my journey into cancer care. Okay, and then where did it sort of go from there? So the staff nurse, choosing the speciality? Yeah, so originally, and, and that's the beauty of nursing, you know, things change a lot as you go along. When I did my nurse training, I had my elective placement in intensive care, and I thought this was brilliant, that was me. I could see my whole career ahead of me, I was going to be an ICU nurse, maybe join the RAF, do in-flight nursing, kind of the, the sexy area of nursing. Um, but I had never had a placement in cancer care. Um, and I saw a job advertised for um, a cancer ward. And I thought, well, I'll do that for a year, get some ward skills, then transfer to ICU, and then I can do the, the kind of emergency nursing. So I started on the cancer ward and I absolutely just fell in love with it. Um, again, really good ward staff, good nursing leadership, and a cohort of patients where you had an individual who was going through cancer treatment and they would often become very acutely unwell. Um, but you also got involved with palliative care um, and involved in a lot of difficult conversations supporting both patients and their families. Um, so you had this combination of acute care but also a lot of the touchy-feely sides of nursing. Um, and as a result I stayed on that ward for about four years, did my chemotherapy training, um, did some courses in grief loss and bereavement counselling um, and, and happened upon the world of cancer nursing which opened so many more doors. And then where did you sort of travel on from there? Well, I always had that little itch within me that I wanted to be an ICU nurse. Um, so after about four or five years on the cancer ward, I transferred down to ICU. Um, my clinical skills had all been in cancer care. Um, and knowing that one day I wanted to kind of work as a ward manager or somewhere in leadership, I thought it would be good to have a, a wider repertoire of clinical skills. Worked in ICU for a year, did really enjoy it, learned a lot. It's the best place to learn about how to manage an acutely unwell patient. Um, but I missed, I missed cancer care. Um, so I took a job then at UCLH working as an early phase clinical trials nurse. Um, again, back into cancer care, so a lot of first in human clinical trials, really interesting work. Um, finished off my masters when I was doing that. And I, I vowed to myself after I finished my masters that I would never study again. Um, and then lo and behold, an email came out from, I think it was UConn's advertising a, a PhD scholarship. And I thought, oh, what's that? Um, and it was in an area that I was interested in, um, supporting patients who were taking oral treatments, so oral um, chemotherapies. Um, thought, well, I'll apply and see what happens. And, uh, and then I got it and started a, started a PhD alongside work, which was good fun. And so how did, uh, how did you, you know, the, the intense nursing environment mm. and also studying for a PhD? Mm. How how did you manage that? Um, well, it, it got to a point actually where I didn't manage it, and it was one of my biggest life lessons was about compassion fatigue. Um, PhD was hard work. I mean, the master's is difficult, but the, for me, the PhD was the next level just because it was so all-consuming. It's almost writing a book, isn't it? PhD. Yeah. So certainly, I've, I'm about to print the final book shortly, um, which will be a big relief. Um, but it's all-consuming. You know, when you work on a ward and you and you leave the ward, you can you can switch off quite easily because you can't take your work home. Um, my PhD study, I did a mixed methods study, so a lot of that was interviews with patients. 
Um, and when you tally up how much work you're doing in a PhD, it does equate to about 80 hours a week just because you're lying in bed at night and then you wake up and, and have a new thought and you can look at the data another way so you quickly make a note and follow that up the next day. Um, but I was still working clinically as, um, as a nurse in Oxford at this time um, within cancer care and unfortunately one of my sisters developed breast cancer during the process so I was studying about 60 plus hours a week working clinically in cancer care and, and then now I had a personal experience with cancer. Um, and I realised at this point I, I was just getting burnt out, I was exhausted um, and really identified with this concept of compassion fatigue where I, I just didn't really have much else to give. Um, so I had to at that time make a decision to actually go back to Ireland uh, where my family were um, and then at that point my second sister developed breast cancer. Um, so we had lots of cancer going on everywhere um, and I, I did get tired out. So in the end I said actually I need to just stop cancer nursing for a while now because I've nothing left to give the patients. Um, and you know people going through cancer are in such a, a dark hour of their life they need as much support as they can get and a lot of that comes from nurses. Um, so I stepped away from it, which at the time was very much the right thing to do. Finished off my PhD um, and I now work as a matron in older people. So I've kind of gone a, a full circle from starting off in a, in a nursing home and um, now looking after older people in a hospital, which is brilliant. Very good. What's the, you know, what's the demographic change there, I suppose, or what are the challenges you now face with, with older people? It's really interesting, yeah. really, really different because you know, I, I think about some of our patients on our wards who are in their late 90s who were treating aggressively with IV antibiotics, people who are fit and well at that age, but they have a lot of comorbidities and that presents huge challenges um, for people within the hospital. And there, there's a bit of a, bit of a thinking out there that perhaps older people's nursing isn't one of the, the sexy areas of nursing, but I tell you now, if you're an older people's nurse, you will have all the skill sets you need because you will be faced with every different medical condition there is. Um, the polypharmacy, the comorbidities, managing that patient is really, really complex. Um, but it's also one of the most rewarding areas, like people's stories at that age. There's so many stories you learn from people. Um, it's just brilliant, I really, really love it. Um, but it's certainly a, a challenging area of the hospital to manage. I was going to say, but you know, the older people are going into the hospital and they've got more, more than three or four different issues, haven't they? Yeah. And people are living longer and you've got great nursing now, you've got, you know, the drugs are getting better, yeah. different solutions and what. So I'd imagine it's really, really challenging. It's challenging. And you know, when, when you're older, a hospital admission has a much bigger impact on you as an individual. So, you know, you don't just develop the urine infection, you also develop a delirium which means then when you're in hospital, you get more confused and more distressed and, and that can just have a spiral effect. Um, and it really needs nursing staff and medical staff who are on it in terms of preempting problems that can happen. Um, at York, we do a lot of work in deconditioning. So we have a real culture of trying to ensure that when our patients are admitted, that they have their own clothes, so they're not in hospital gowns and they wear trainers rather than the non-slip bed socks. And, and those little things that can really help try and prevent somebody declining is really, really important, particularly during an acute admission. That's really interesting. So that means that basically they, you're trying to get them home. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so I think it was the is it no pyjama? Did yeah. I hear about that somewhere? I can't remember who told me about that, with no pyjamas on the wards, because otherwise yeah. they're bed bound, you want to get them out and running, and move, well, running, but moving around. Well, running's good as well, <laughs> we can do that, happy days. Um, but I, again, that's a wider culture change that's needed, because it's still, you know, you would associate coming into hospital that you want your dressing gown yeah. and your comfy pyjamas, because you're not feeling well. But actually, getting a pair of tracksuit bottoms on and a t-shirt, and getting out of bed in the morning, and getting your trainers on, and, and walking around the wards with the physios and the OTs and the nurses, can have such a huge impact on, on terms of somebody bouncing back from an acute illness. Yeah. It's really important. Don't let you wallow in, uh, in self-pity, get you moving around. Um, obviously you find your work rewarding, you can mm -hmm. hear the passion you talk about it, but what are sort of, sort of the biggest challenges or the top three challenges you face at the moment? I mean, if you're asking top three challenges, the first one has always got to be staffing. Okay. Um, however, I say that tentatively because when I started work in the NHS nearly 15 years ago, the complaint was always we've not enough staff. Um, well, actually, I think in some cases we do have a lot of staff there. We just need to be very creative with how we work. Um, but there is no denying in the UK that currently we have such a shortage of nurses. Um, I mean, it's beyond the scope of this interview to go into an in-depth political discussion as to how that's come about or how we can solve that. The reality is we don't have enough nurses, so we need to think very creatively about how we work. Um, and I would say that is one of our biggest challenges. And, you, you know, supporting wards where there's short staffing it's really challenging because 
obviously we want to focus on retention and making sure we have a happy workplace for staff but that's very difficult when you've got one nurse to 10 or 15 patients and you just haven't got other RNs you can bring in to support. Really, really difficult time. Um, but there are things we can do. So certainly in York, we've got a lot of band four roles and they are invaluable. We have some associate practitioners and nursing associates and they have been such an asset to our wards and the registered nurses there, they're brilliant. Um, so that's really helped. We've just trialled a new role actually um, on some of our wards called the Patient Services Operative. Okay. Um, and it's a, it's a band two role, like a healthcare assistant role. But when we looked at some of our patient experience and feedback, we realised that a lot of our issues were around some of the, the basic elements of nursing care, if you like. So patients weren't getting drinks very quickly. Um, people were often missing a cup of tea now and again. And, and there was challenges with answering nurse call bell, bells in a timely fashion. Um, so we developed a role that was purely focused on giving drinks. So we have what we call PSOs. Um, so they do hourly drinks wine drinks rounds on the ward, um, they're helping patients fill out menus and hospital menus are really complex. They are not easy to fill out, okay. um, especially if you're in your 80s or 90s and you get this big list. Um, but having someone who has the time to go around and make sure that menu's filled in properly um, and that your individual who perhaps is struggling with appetite can order something that they really like makes such a big difference to patient experience. I was going to say, that's the care element again, isn't it? Exactly, and that's time, yeah. isn't it? Because you, unfortunately you read, don't you, about, you hear about people dehydrating and they die in hospitals yeah. and you're like, how does that happen? Yeah. You can kind of understand if you've got one nurse against 10 you know, running around us. And the whole really point of this role was to free up the staff who are involved in personal care to, to do personal care because yeah. they know someone is going around with the drinks trolley on the hour every hour and people are getting the drinks that they need. And um, so it's been really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, nurse staffing is certainly a challenge. Um, what other challenges do we face? There's a lot of change, isn't there, in the NHS. We've got a changing workforce and, and changing environment, but change isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, if we look at advancements in our healthcare, it's always changing and I think the workforce and way of working actually needs to change as well to reflect that. If we look at the introduction of the band four role, um, you know, there'd be a lot of kind of, not negativity, but apprehension with that role coming in. Nice. Um, but I, I think it's brilliant. I've seen it work really well. Um, I've seen the individuals really well supported and their impact on the wards has been huge. That's really interesting because some of the nurses we've interviewed here about the nursing associate role have said, oh, it's just trying to replace nurses, which it isn't. Um, and then some other people, you know, for you to say you've got the experience of it and you're dealing with it and you say mm. they're actually really supporting nurses, mm. that's a really interesting perspective. Yeah, I, I don't think the nurse associate is there to replace the nurse. I think they're there to complement the nurse. Mm. Um, you know, the future of nursing, I think, really um, will not be dissolving the role of the nurse, but bringing together much more integration. I was having a discussion recently with one of our lead AHPs in the trust and, and we were discussing hypothetically could a, an OT or a physio be a ward manager? Well, I don't see why not. Um, you know, we look at the ward setting, a physio and a, an occupational therapist will help a patient go to the bathroom, will get a glass of water if a patient asks for a drink. Um, there's no reason why we cannot integrate those roles more fully. Um, so I think there's a lot of change coming up in the future, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Now, do you, do you, and do you think something like that is looking at the wellness aspect? Yeah. You know, if you're looking at occupational therapists and you're looking at, um, you know, AHPs, they're looking at the wellness to try and stop the patient coming back. Yeah. You know, that's sort of, yeah. you know, they're talking about the prevention, aren't they, nowadays? And not only in the US very much, so they're all about wellness mm. and trying to keep patients from going into the hospitals because it's so much more expensive to get them in there. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm thinking again in our trust minute in York, you know, our, our physios and OTs have such a crucial role. And we were talking about deconditioning and, and trying to prevent patients declining. Well, on one of our wards, the, uh, the OTs had applied for a pot of money and they hold a weekly tea party. Um, but you know, the OTs and physios, they do this so well. Um, they're so skilled at really engaging patients in that. And often in nursing, we get um, kind of, not bogged down, but distracted by the personal care needs, which are very high and very demanding. And, and sometimes our AHPs have the skill set to go in and create these diversional activities, which really engage people, um, not only socially, but also in their own medical care. Um, and it's hugely, hugely helpful. So I think the AHP and nursing boundary needs to dissolve a little bit and come together closer. Do you see that with the doctors and the nurses these days? Obviously you have a you know, career so far from when you started to where it is now. I think, yeah, it's funny because I, I trained back in Ireland we're a little bit more traditional in some respects and, and certainly in different trusts there's lots of different cultures, isn't there? So the, the relationship between the doctor and the nurse will vary depending on where you are. Um, where that relationship is good is where there's real teamwork. Um, and I think just coming together as a team is so, so important, especially in this 
current age we are in the NHS where staffing shortages are so acute. Um, one of the best doctors I ever worked with, um, I fell in love with her, she's my best friend now. Um, and the reason I was so attracted to her as a doctor is because she sat by a patient's bedside and, and was doing what you might think is the role of the nurse and supporting a patient during a, um, an acute medical event. Um, and she was just applying a, a tepid sponge to a gentleman's forehead. And, and I just thought as a registrar working in an oncology ward doing that, I said that that's what we need to be doing. That it's not that the doctor does this, the nurse does that. It's about coming together for what the patient needs. Um, and you can see that really quite clearly in a lot of areas. So it's, it's, it's an exciting time. Good stuff. And obviously varied career, different wards, different patients. Yeah. What, what's the most memorable story, thought you've got, got for us so far? I'm sure many more not interesting awards. ones to come. Or not award, you know, whatever the most memorable thing. Oh, I didn't really know that was in nursing. Or that patient made a miraculous recovery. Mm. So I think there's a, the beauty of nursing is that you get to meet people and you get to meet people sometimes in some of the darkest moments mm. of their lives. Um, and you get people that stand out to you. And I think one person that stands out um, was a gentleman who had terminal cancer. Um, and he was admitted to the ward. I was the nurse in charge on, a, on his admission and developed a, a hematology malignancy. I gave him his first chemotherapy and over a nine month journey, you, you develop a real close bond with individuals. Um, and one Saturday I came in and, and he wasn't himself. Um, we just knew something wasn't quite right. And he was approaching the last days of his life. I said, you know, what's going on? How are you feeling today? And he said, you know, I just want to buy my wife and daughter dinner before I die. Um, and I'll never forget it because I just saw pure love in this man, um, a real love for his wife and his child. Um, and thankfully we were resourced to be able to get a syringe driver with some morphine and get him prepared. And he actually, we booked a, a wheelchair a taxi and I phoned his daughter and they came in and they went to a local restaurant um, at the hospital that day and, and they went for a buffet lunch um, and he came back. And for me, it's one of the most poignant memories of nursing where you know, it's an intimacy so intimate, you don't even recognize it's intimate. You know, this man's last days of life and his wish was just to buy his wife and daughter dinner. Um, and you get to be a part of that as the nurse and you get to be a part of that journey. And I remember about six months later, his daughter came back in the morgue and gave me a little nurse's fob watch with my name ingrained. Um, and for me personally, it's just one of the most rewarding moments to have, you know, you can't fix that situation, you, but you can help, you can offer a bit of support and you can journey with that person. Um, and that is so unique, um, and unique to nursing and healthcare. Um, and that, that'll stay with me for the rest of my life, that individual. How do you, you know, cope with that, that environment where you do have terminally ill patients? Mm. Yeah, that must be emotionally quite draining. I think it is, yeah. What, how do you learn to cope with it? I don't know if you do, and if you have learned to cope with it, then perhaps it's maybe time to move on. Okay. Um, because people are in real pain, um, and they're suffering, and it's not about feeling sympathy for people, it's about empathizing with them. Um, and Brene Brown does a brilliant YouTube video um, where she talks about empathy and what is empathy and it's about getting down with the person and journeying with them. And I think that's what you do as the nurse and I think for me when you have really sad stories and, and very sad cases which are heartbreaking, you know, it's not necessarily my place to grieve for that person and grieve for the family but it's my place to help them so I can come alongside and, and talk to them about pain control and pain management and, and offer different scenarios and, and try and support as best I can. Um, and I think being able to help, being able to journey alongside is, is what keeps you going. Very good. And so we've been doing a, uh, a project, haven't you seen it yet, with, uh, with We Nurses, mm -hmm. about social media for nurses and how mm. social media can help. I know you're on Twitter yeah. and LinkedIn, a number of things. How, how do you sort of see social media helping nurses moving forward? Um, so I, I cannot profess to be any expert on Twitter. Um, I'm by no so means join, an expert. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a very valuable resource and I think it's connecting with people, it's a huge thing. And internationally, it's a massive thing. I recently did a Winston Churchill travel fellowship and a lot of the contacts, contacts I made from that was through Twitter, through identifying people who kind of had an online presence and were sharing a bit of their work. And I was able to plug into them and then go meet them in America and Canada. Um, so it's a really, really helpful platform to network and come together. Um, but, but it's risky to you. I think you always need to remember that once you've said something, it's out there. Um, and it's about being genuine and authentic, um, but being careful too. We need to use it sensibly and wisely. Very good. And, and how do you sort of see technology affecting healthcare at the moment, pros and cons? I'd say for me, um, we don't use technology well um, in the NHS, in my opinion. 
um, I don't think we have embraced it fully or incorporated it fully and I recently went to as I mentioned America to look at some hospitals and it's a very different setting over there completely different um, but in some hospitals they have well embedded technology and to see how that directly impacts on not only the patient experience but the health professional experience is huge. Um, one of my trusts had gone paperless um, and as a nurse working within that trust it was fantastic. You were able to write your nursing notes very contemporaneously so as you were going you could document um, and it, it cut down this one hour at the end of a shift trying to suddenly document all this stuff um, and doing electronic drug grounds. When that technology is well embedded it's really helpful not just for the, the nurse doing the drug grind but for the patient because it frees you up to give more care at the bedside which really is what, what nursing is all about. Um, so I, I, you know, we talk about the digital transformation being top of the agenda but it's 2019, I think we need to crack on a bit and get it embedded now, just do it. Do you think that, that technology advancement will help with the shortage of nurses? Um, I think you can never replace a nurse with technology but technology is there and it can enhance what we do and it can provide you with more time and we need to be harnessing that now. And um, you were at the House of Lords recently? Mm. So I'm told. Yeah, I mean that, that's the beauty of nursing, you never know where you're going to end up. Um, yeah, so I'd applied for a Winston Churchill Travel Fellowship, um, which is brilliant. They have loads available and nurses need to, to tap into this because it's incredible. Um, so off the back of my PhD, in my PhD I looked at how we care for patients taking an oral chemotherapy in the UK. Um, and there was very little research out about that and oral treatments were quite new. So my findings really had looked at the patient experience and health professional experience of taking that treatment. What the Winston Churchill Trust enabled me to do was go to America and Canada to look at people who had done similar research or pioneered similar models of care to actually go and visit them. What does it look like abroad? How do you manage patients who are on these new treatments? Because um, it's quite complex. But that, that trust enabled me to fly out and not just um, visit these areas, but actually meet the people who had pioneered new models of care. And, and we can read about research in journal articles, and there's a lot on there online. But what we don't publish is what doesn't work, um, and there's so much learning to be had from that. So going to meet individuals and actually discuss their journey in terms of how they got to implementing a new model of care has been absolutely invaluable. Um, so I've just written the report, um, the report has now been submitted, about to share it, writing the publication with some colleagues out in America, um, and that wouldn't have been possible without that funding from the Winston Churchill Trust. So in short, they offer money to, to go out to another area of the world where you can learn how they do something with the viewpoint of bringing that back to implement it into the UK. So it's really, really helpful. So what did you have to do at the House of Lords then? So the House of Lords <laughs> then, so we went for an afternoon tea with uh, one of the Viscounts who is like a, a sponsor contributor to the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Um, so every year they do a gathering, maybe it's every six months, okay. um, and you come down for an afternoon tea, see the House of Lords, get a wee tour, and uh, meet some of the other fellows. Cucumber sandwiches and, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, very cream good. tea, macarons. <laughs> One of the challenges we always talk about it is the bursary, yeah. which obviously we still have in Northern Ireland, yeah. Scotland and Wales, mm -hmm. but in England for some reason we don't. Yeah. It's a challenge. Very challenging, and I mean, my guilty confession is, I would say if there wasn't a bursary there, I might not have gone into nursing. Um, but because there was funding available, I thought, well, you know what, I'm gonna go for that one. I haven't got the same fees, I'm not gonna end up with the same debt. Now, it was a, a lucky coincidence that I actually loved being a nurse, um, but it did incentivize me initially to consider applying for the role. And I think it's vital, you know, doing a nursing degree is not like any other degree. It is hard work doing placements alongside essays. You don't have the opportunity to go out and get a part-time job. Um, is it 2,300 hours you have to do a placement, don't you? A lot, On yeah. On top of your degree, which is where do you get the time to do you know, part-time work? a hard time. Yeah, it's not, Being you're travelling in and it's intense, not isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't just go to your job, you don't just rock up and do a shift. You're there to learn, you're there to constantly be soaking in new information, learning from lots of different healthcare professionals. That's tiring. That's tiring learning how to do that job. Um, Are you just on day shifts as a student nurse? Yeah, uh, you have to do some night shifts. You have to do not as many. Okay, but um, even but then. Some. But even then, that's tricky, you know, body clock and what have you, and running through the night and being alert. Yeah, it's really difficult. It's really, especially when you're learning. You know, learning is tiring. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be really well supported to do it. And that bursary helps, really, really helps. So uh, we need to get it back on the map. Agreed.
I know we were speaking earlier about men in nursing, but we're not going to go on to that. But how, do, how, yeah. we, how are you thinking about how we get more people into nursing? Yeah, I'm glad you've said that. It's about people and nurses, not Correct. just about men. Um, but, you know, it would be great to have more men in nursing too. Um, I think really it's about challenging the perception of what nursing is. Um, you know, th there's lots of debates out there. Should nurses have degrees? Should they have diplomas? I personally don't think it really matters what you've got. To be a nurse, you don't need the PhD, the master's, the degree. You need to care about people. You need to be able to be the person at the bedside who's got the training to recognise when somebody's getting acutely unwell and how to manage that. But you've got to be able to, to sit down beside your patient and support them at their level. Um, you don't need a degree or a master's or a PhD to do that. You just need to care. Um, and I think that's the point, you know, if you wanted a job where you really get to step into people's lives and make a difference, you might not fix them, you might not cure them, but you're going to journey with them and during that you're going to be able to help them, then nursing's the job. Um, and I think for me personally, you know, nursing opens so many doors, you could never be bored in nursing. Um, you know, I've been a qualified nurse now for coming up in 10 years and because of being a nurse I've travelled to about seven different states in the USA. I worked in Haiti in a disaster relief campaign for three weeks. Um, you know, you can travel the world, you can do what you want and, you know, I went into nursing thinking I was going to join the army and work in the emergency nursing and I ended up in cancer care and, and now I'm in older people. So, you know, you don't necessarily know where you're going to go and, and that's not a bad thing. It's really quite exciting. Where, where do you think your next steps are going to be? I don't know. I think the long-term goal for me would be to um, work in sustainable healthcare. Um, I did my master's in global health at UCL and I loved working abroad. Um, and I think there's so many things we do incredibly well in the UK. Um, but there's not necessarily equity and, and access to healthcare internationally. I think that's a key issue. But I think to be able to have an impact on that and make a change in that, you need to be informed. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, myself, I want to spend a good 20 years in the NHS learning about how we do implement um, equal healthcare and access to healthcare, but crucially learning how a healthcare system works, um, both managerial-wise, leadership-wise, but economically as well, um, so that I, I hopefully one day will have a bit of an impact on sustainable healthcare interventions in the future. But I think you, you can't learn that from a book, you've got you to get the experience. So. Yeah, learn it from more senior people, shadowing yeah, you in. Yeah, exactly. But you to learn from senior nurses. And what, you know, what are the sort of things or trends you see of the future coming up over the next five years in the nursing arena? Wow, I mean that's a big question, my goodness. Um, we, like, we like to hear everyone's, opi everyone's opinion. I, do you know, I think we just need to embrace change. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think a greater integration of the different healthcare professionals out there, I'd like to see that happen a bit more. Um, I want to see nurses working much more closely with AHPs. Um, I want to see doctors working much closely with nurses and embracing change and embracing what's new. Change is often difficult and unsettling, um, but the nature of our role, things are always going to change, so we just need to get used to change. Um, and I think the key thing is about having the right people driving forward those changes. Um, as long as you've got the right leaders in place, I think we'll be okay. Michael, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Is there any message you'd like to give to our nurses watching the channel? Um, I'd say keep going. It's tough times. Um, it's busy times, but we're there for a reason. Um, the patient experience is absolutely crucial. Um, and no matter what job you're working in, as long as you've got patient experience on, on, at the forefront of your mind, you'll do a good job. Superb. Michael, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching The Voice of Nursing. Uh, thank you to all our nurses, allied health professionals, doctors and carers that look after us all. And we'll catch up with you again soon.